Hi guys and welcome back to another Dot Race video and today we're going to be playing MotoGP 21 and of course it is time for the MotoGP 21 season race recap and of course we'll be doing it with Miguel Oliveira. Now we are going to be discussing the four races out of this weekend here in Catalonia and starting off first is going to be Moto E. Now Moto E started with drama and of course Moto E was the actually the last race on the calendar but I do like to get uh, Moto E, Moto 3, Moto 2, and eventually Moto GP at the end of the video. But for Moto E, it started with drama, and this drama occurred due to Eric Granado's bike not starting or not working properly on the actual grid. Now, Eric Granado was set to start from pole position in a magnificent Catalan Grand Prix, and however, it was not meant to be for the uh, Brazilian rider, of course, very, very strong in Moto E this season. In my opinion, he's probably the favourite to win it all, but couldn't even start the race due to an absolute unknown issue. Which, for, for me, I think it's really, really unfair that these Moto E bikes, they don't exactly start as much as like MotoGP bikes do. They don't start the same way. So basically, for this one, Moto E do the one sighting lap, go to the pit, wait for the build-up to occur, wait for the build-up to finish, and then straight onto the motorcycle. They don't have a traditional warm-up lap. So it's not truly Eric Granado's fault if the bike didn't start as he is ready and waiting on the grid. Granted, you could say, yes, the team's at fault for that one. That is the team's responsibility to make sure the bike works. But he wasn't even allowed to start the Grand Prix. He had to be moved over to the race, uh, into the pit lane, and start the race from there. Personally, for me, I think that's a bit unfair. But, of course, it still made the races very interesting. Now, I'm going to big Eric Granado up for that one. And then, unfortunately, let you know that he crashed into uh, turn four, I believe it was. And that is devastating. After clawing his way back from pit lane up into about 11th position to then crash and earn no points. But the actual winners of the day was Mikel Pons winning his first Moto E race. And great story for Mikel Pons. After just last week in Le Mans, he crashed on the sighting lap. So that is absolutely huge for Mikel Pons. And another great result for Dominic Egata. Just winning the World Supersport race in Estoril just a couple of days ago. Comes here to Catalonia, messes around a bit, and takes a magnificent second place. And of course the Moto E World Cup winner from last season, Jordi Torres, finishes out on the podium. Now the race was very, very interesting and very exciting. It was very much similar to a Moto 3 bikes, but different machines of course. Really, really great race. I enjoyed it a lot. Disappointed about Eric Granado, uh, Matea Cassade and Jasper Imama, Chavi Cardalus, and of course, as mentioned, Eric Granado all crashed out in this Grand Prix. But uh, good stuff for Alessandro Zaccone. Looks like he's really got some momentum going since the second place in uh, Le Mans. Or the third place, I think he got demoted down. And great result for an old favourite of mine, Yoni Hernandez. Good to see him still doing well, but in Moto E this time, not uh, in the Pramac Ducati team as he once were. But well, we are kind of short for time today due to the uh, four races, so I will have to move on from there. The rest of the Grand Prix was very much a battle for attrition and a massive battle towards the end. So thank you for Moto E. It was absolutely awesome. It's a shame we had to wait to the end. I'd rather have it at the beginning of the schedule. Speaking of the beginning of the schedule, of course, Moto 3. Starting off the schedule in MotoGP is absolutely the best thing in the world. It really gets you going, really sets things up beautifully for the main event at uh, MotoGP, the third race usually in the Grand Prix. But Moto3, wow, it did not disappoint, and it never does to be fair. Moto3 is absolutely terrific, and here in Catalonia, exactly the same once again. So Sergio Garcia, SG11, wins here in Catalan GP with Jeremy Alcoba and Denitz on Chu in third place. So a Grassini Gas Gas, a Honda for the Indonesian Racing Grassini team, and of course, Red Bull KTM. So all three manufacturers in the top three. Uh, excuse me, we don't have Husqvarna, but it's pretty much a KTM anyway. And, well, to be honest with the same thing with a Gas Gas anyway, but I digress. Jamal Masia was originally on the podium, and he was my pick to win it, and you really can't gamble on a Moto3 race, and I wouldn't condone it either, because it's so, so unpredictable. He did actually finish third on the podium until he ran wide and allegedly went onto the green. And due to him going onto the green and exceeding track limits, he was demoted one position. Now, there was a lot of crashes and there was a lot of carnage in Moto3. The race actually got red flagged once it finished. And it's bizarre to think that, but as the top eight riders finished across the line, 
everything was red flagged. I think it might have been 11 riders went across the line and then the entire race was red flagged. So the rest of the riders who technically didn't finish is from 12th down to last place into 24th. Now, bearing in mind, Ricardo Rossi had a nightmare. He didn't even start. He crashed on the warm-up lap, which we'll still yet to discuss another person who did that. So, Ethan Guevara, Ayumi Sasaki, Dennis Foggia, Xavi Artigas, Philip Salach, Adrian Fernandez, John McPhee, Andrea Mino, and Tatsuki Suzuki all crashed out of this Catalan GP. That is too many riders crashing out. Now, the John McPhee incident, he was leading the Grand Prix, crashed going into Turn 3 losing the rear and unfortunately collected or close enoughly collected Tatsu Suzuki and Andrea Mino they both sort of jumped on the front brake at the chance and jumped on it too quickly and sent both of them down and the actual red flag incident came in turn eight where literally four or five riders crashed I think I do believe Ayumi Sasaki dropped the bike and Xavi Artigas the other layer par racing Honda such as Dennis Foggia all bumped into it and had a massive off Pretty scary stuff in Moto3. I think the best course of action was definitely to red flag the race. But a incredible race. There's a lot of talking points in Moto3. A lot of people are saying that it was more dangerous and more scary than it was actually entertaining. I do see both sides of this view. There was some stupid manoeuvres in Moto3. More so Jeremy Alcoba not wanting to lead onto the final straight. So going into turn 11, going into turn 12 and just sitting the bike up on the racing line. That is extremely dangerous and that should be squashed immediately. It needs to be nipped in the bud. Darren Binder, one of the most aggressive riders in Moto3. Even he felt uncomfortable during that Grand Prix. Now there was a lot of incidents. I do believe Gabriel Rodrigo, it might have been uh, Jeremy Alcoba, one of the Indonesian racing Grassini riders, that basically just cut off the nose at Pedro Acosta at one point. There was a bit of gesticulation between the race and from Pedro Acosta and a couple of the riders. Things got very aggressive out there and a little bit too heated. I know these guys are 16 going up to 28 years old, but you know we want everyone to come home safe. That's the main thing, and especially after the, the uh, unfortunate disaster last time out in Mugello regarding Jason de Pasquier. May he rest in peace and ride in peace. We don't want something like that to happen again, God forbid, because it is just not good. And it was very, very, very aggressive. Granted, you could say it's entertaining because these guys aren't holding back, but I heard the same thing for Marquez with Maverick Vinales when he was bugging him the other week that, oh, it's only race and they're not there to be friends. True, but at the same time, let's make sure everyone goes home safe. But that's just from me. I'm not preaching to anyone and I'm not scolding anyone. Thank you for the entertainment to the Moto3 boys, but that's just simply my opinion. And of course, we'll be moving on now to Moto2 to discuss the Grand Prix. Now, unfortunately, I'm going to say this and I hate saying this, but... I think everyone felt the same. My Discord server went dead. Nobody was discussing it. The Moto2 race was a bit boring. However, it's not a bad thing to say it was boring because it's actually very interesting for the championship, but the actual action was lacking. Now, there was a good couple of moments in there that Remy Gardner's overtake on, Adrian, on Raul Fernandez was extremely good. There were some talking points. There was a few crashes in there, unfortunately. But still, not the most entertaining race of this season. But Remy Gardner... Wow, my friend, you need to take a bow because you are on an absolute tear right now. Winning in Mugello, winning here again in Catalonia, and winning in life as you've just signed a brand new MotoGP contract with Tech3 KTM. You have everything right now, Remy Gardner, and you just need to keep on riding the momentum. Amazing job from Remy Gardner. You really can't fault exactly everything what he did in the Catalan Grand Prix, allowing Raul Fernandez to get through, seeing what's happening, see what he's going to be doing, and then when he's ready, overtake the leader, and then ride home safely and take another victory. Superb job from Remy Garden. I can't say enough about his performance, but I don't want to take that away from Raul Fernandez. Again, the seasoned veteran slash rookie. Amazing this guy is. It's only his seventh round in Moto2, and he is a championship contender throughout and throughout. He is brilliant. And people are talking that he might be poached and going into MotoGP as one of the satellite Yamaha riders. Now, it's not confirmed that it will be the Patronus Sprinter team because they're not sure what's going to happen with that one. They might be a Yamaha. They might be a new team. Is Rossi going to buy out Yamaha? Who knows what's going to actually happen. But for the main thing, I'm only concerned about Raul Fernandez right now. The man is great. 
and he could very well be in MotoGP next season along with his teammate. Now speaking of the rest of the riders, we had a few crashes in this one. Uh, Hector Garso and Fabio Di Giantonio going into turn one. Fabio Di Giantonio cutting the nose off Hector Garso and sending both of the riders into the kitty litter. Now Fabio Di Giantonio this season, he's talked about going into a Grassini next season. It's not necessarily confirmed if that will be with a, an Aprilia or potentially a Ducati. I need to do a bit more research on that one. But uh, I personally, for me, I don't think Fabio Di Giantonio is ready for MotoGP yet. By all means, Fabio, I hope he proves me wrong because I don't like doubting anyone. But personally, for me, I think maybe another season in Moto2. He's still making a lot of silly mistakes. He made the mistakes in Le Mans, and he's doing it again here today, or excuse me, yesterday, in the Catalan GP. So I'm not sure about Fabio going to MotoGP just yet. And of course, making silly errors and taking other riders out is, is not really worthy of a MotoGP seat yet just to mention. But now I mention Ayagora. He had a magnificent Moto2 streak at the minute. 7th places, 6th places, 8th places. Brilliant stuff. And he crashed out at 8th place, which would have been another brilliant finish for Ayagora. But I don't doubt for a second that he's going to come back and do extremely well in Moto2 when he gets back onto the bike. Probably next time out. So fingers crossed for Ayagora. He bounces back pretty quickly on that one. Lorenzo Dalla Porta not adapting to Moto2 like we thought he would. He crashed out alongside his former teammate Marcos Ramirez in separate incidences. Now Aaron Canet, another Moto3 or former Moto3 rider now into Moto2. Adapting well but still making mistakes. I guess that's the difference between Moto3 to Moto2. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot more pressure on you. There's a lot bigger bikes and it's more serious. But unfortunately those three guys crashing out once again. Now, speaking of the Brits, Jake Dixon, one of my favourite riders, only finished in 18th after starting at the back of the grid. Sam Lowe's disappointing result for him as well, finishing in 7th place. Interesting in the sense of results, it was pretty good for the championship for Remy Gardner and the Red Bull KTM team, but ultimately not the most interesting of races as far as entertainment goes and the actual spectacle itself. But one good news... It's good to see the fans back in the Catalan GP. I can't wait to hear more air horns and cheers and flag waving next time around in round eight. Fingers crossed we have them back again. I don't know which tracks they're allowed at, but fingers crossed they're allowed for uh, the Saxon Ring, Assen, and hopefully many, many more. But now we move on to the main spectacle that went right after Moto3, and that is Moto GP. Now, I've tried to time this well, so we have plenty of time to discuss Moto GP. It's probably not very enough time to discuss it, and I like to talk a lot, so let's crack on and discuss the MotoGP race. So first and foremost, as you've noticed, I am using Miguel Oliveira, the race winner of the Catalan GP. Absolute magnificent race from Miguel Oliveira. He was stupendous, extremely great, under pressure, under serious pressure from the likes of Johan Zarco, Fabio Quattararo, Jack Miller at one point, and even Joan Mir. The guy's amazing. Really, really great job, only in his third year. Fantastic for Miguel Oliveira. Beating Joan Zarco and Jack Miller on the podium. Now, I know what you're thinking. We need to discuss something regarding the pre-race favourite, Fabio Quattararo, the world championship leader, the Frenchman who is doing a superb job this season. Had a little bit of an incident, let's say, in MotoGP's race, roughly into Turn 3. Oh, going onto the right-hand side just before Turn 4. Fabio Quattararo discarded something. We didn't see what it was at the time, but something was discarded and thrown away quite abruptly. It later revealed that this was his chest plate, and Fabio was uncomfortable or something had happened to the chest plate, and he removed it mid-race. Now, the concerning thing was that his chest was revealed and his leather suit was not fully zipped up. Now, the main concerning part of that is, I don't want to go into detail, but if Fabio were to crash with a leather suit open on his front, I wouldn't even want to think about what that would look like. The average person is down to bone on about 30 miles an hour, maybe even 20 miles an hour. MotoGP bikes do up to 220 miles an hour. I'm not going to say anything more than why on earth wasn't he not black flagged? Personally, I don't care about the championship, I don't care about the points. What is most important is making sure our riders are safe. And considering what happened just last week when a rider lost his life in Jason Depasquier, we really can't be taking seri We really can't be lax when it comes to rider safety. These guys are heroes to everyone. Don't care if you're a Marquez fan, a Rossi fan, a Lorenzo fan, 
all the people who might hate each other in the world because of their rider affiliation. I don't care who it is. I want to make sure every single rider comes home safe. That is someone's father. That's someone's idol. Regardless, I might be playing this a little bit too heavy, but for me, it's really concerning. I was wincing every single time I seen Fabio's chest wide open. And God bless him, he has a great chest, to be fair to him. But I don't want to see it open during a race weekend. I don't want to see it, and it's because that was dangerous. If he had one moment, it could have been fatal. That's all I'm saying. I guess I'm being pretty much heavy about that one. But I'm very passionate about making sure our riders are safe and very, very sound. But that is my two pence regarding that incident. I'm really curious to see what you guys think. Even one of the legends themselves, Casey Stoner, tweeted on Twitter just how much that he felt that the race should have been black flagged. And of course, you've just heard my opinions. I totally agree with Casey on that one. And of course, I'm very curious to see if you guys agree. So let me know in the comments section down below how you think it should have been handled. Was it handled properly? And what would you do in the same instance? But for now, we aren't finished with the World Championship lady just yet. He did finish third place without not having his leather suit fully zipped up. However, it was short-lived as he did abuse the track limits into Turn 1. He tried to fix his suit, he tried to fix everything and zip it back up. Allegedly. However, I didn't see that. All I seen was he ran wide because he got too close to Joan Zarco, lost out in the position and still kept the same advantage as he would have had right behind, even though he just cut the corner. So, the, basically, because he cut the corner, didn't drop a second back, Jack Miller inherited third place and therefore Fabio was demoted to fourth. And then following on from that, because Fabio had the whole instance with his uh, leather suit being open, they decided to penalise him after the race down to sixth place. Which, for me, is... It's not enough, but the race is over. Why penalise him again? I don't know. He should have just been black flagged there and then. But spent too much time speaking about Fabio Quattro. So let's move on to his teammate, Maverick Vinales. Vinales not looking his self. Since the win in Qatar to start the championship off this season, he's just disappeared. He has not been anywhere near. I hate saying this, but Maverick is so unreliable. I don't know what's going to happen with Maverick Vinales. He believes in Yamaha. Yamaha believe in him. But I'm not sure Yamaha is best suited for Maverick at the moment. Perhaps a change, but don't know which bike to go to. But fingers crossed they figure it out and Maverick gets being up into the top spot once again. Big shout out to Joan Mir. It looked like he was saving something throughout that race. Qualifying well for a change, or somewhat better let's say. He was the only Suzuki representing the brand of course this weekend due to Alex Rins' injury. And of course he got himself up into 4th place in the race, or at least 5th place before Fabio Quattraro was demoted. Not quite the Joan Mir we thought we would get, but still I'm happy to see him being competitive and up there with the best of them. Not the great results for Peko Banyaya either, finishing in 7th place. Not the best job in the world for the, champ with the former championship leader, but still doing a grand job nonetheless. Now we are going to discuss the crashes of the weekend because there was far too many MotoGP crashes. One of them even coming in this sighting lap. Jorge Martin crashing before he even got to the grid. Really shocking stuff from the former Moto3 world champion. However, he is okay and managed to start the race on the second bike. Paul Spargo on the Repsol Honda. He crashed out quite early on. Really tough time for Spargo on that Repsol Honda. But unfortunately, we aren't finished with the Repsol Honda. Now one of the most decorated riders in MotoGP Marquez crashing out into the newly revised Turn 10. And the newly revised Turn 10 didn't just catch out one multiple world champion. They caught out Valentino Rossi as well, of course. Nine times world champion. Two of the most decorated riders in MotoGP right now. Both fell foul to the newly revised Turn 10. Alicia Spargro, Turn 10, claimed another victim once again. Another experienced Italian, Danilo Petrucci, crashing out into Turn 9. Ika Lekawona, satellite KTM Tech 3 rider, also crashing out of the Grand Prix. Difficult to watch so many crashes in a weekend that I didn't expect it. Of course, this is a magnificent track, which a lot of riders love, but there was still far too many crashes. And disappointed to see Rossi crash as well. He did so well in the practice session and looked pretty good into free practice four, only five tenths of a second away from the top spot, but unfortunately crashing out and sending all those yellow fans into dismay once again. Not good for the Petronas sprinter team once again. Franco Morbidelli only finishing in ninth place 
after even considering a race win was even possible. Now that will conclude my race recap of round 7 of the MotoGP World Championship. I do hope you've enjoyed this video as much as I've enjoyed making it and discussing it. I do really, really enjoy chatting and talking and discussing MotoGP. So if you've got anything to chat about, let me know in the comments section down below. And of course I will always catch up and have a good chin wag with the aces. But that will conclude today's video. Those are my lap times on screen as well. So I hope uh, that entertained you whilst you were listening to my dulcet tones, if you will. But guys, upon that note, thank you very much for watching as always. Let me know in the comment section down below what you want to discuss. And I guess that is going to conclude from me. So like, comment and subscribe if you enjoyed. Hit the notification bell to be alerted to every single Dot Trace upload. And of course, I do upload every single day. And when I do the MotoGP videos, that is twice a day. And that starts very, very soon. We begin our Moto2 journey with Matt Grant on board the Patronus SRT Calex Moto2 machine. So guys, thanks for watching as always. And I will see you next time. Ciao for now. Oh hi, didn't quite see you there. Good to see you're still here. If this video didn't quite set your appetite, then why not watch some more Dot Trace content by clicking the video shown on screen now. Furthermore, if you would like to follow me on social media, you can do so now with the links down in the description. Consider subscribing so you don't miss a single Dot Trace video.